After almost five decades, we are still fighting the war on drugs. And what do we have to show for it? With 2.1 million people currently incarcerated, our prison population is the largest in the world. Last year, more people died from overdoses than American troops killed during the Vietnam War. In some communities, preventable disease among people who use drugs remains at epidemic levels. If this war is about controlling drugs, can we really say that we're winning? So in the United States, they have sold us this idea that drug prohibition means that we are controlling drugs. We see now in the overdose crisis, there's a necessity for us to talk about removing criminal penalties and eventually talking about what does regulation look like. Imagine a country that once suffered from record-breaking overdose deaths. Now imagine that country figuring out a solution that not only worked to prevent those overdose deaths, but also to help people who use drugs get treatment on demand if they wanted it. And that country is the United States of America. Portugal. Portugal was in the midst of an overdose crisis. Its prisons were bulging at the seams with people jailed for little more than simple drug possession. HIV rates among people who use drugs were the highest in all of Europe. Portugal had a serious problem. Faced with a decision, the country could either keep doing the same thing, filling its jails and burying its people, or they could try something new. We had a problem, and we put together a group of experts that knew the problem we had, knew the society we had, knew the tools we had to eventually address the problem. And then they made recommendations that were feasible in our society. Portugal made the decision to decriminalize the personal use of all drugs. And while decriminalization may sound complex, it's actually pretty simple to understand. Portugal removed criminal penalties, things like jail time, police records, and large sanctions for possession of small amounts of drugs. Drugs still aren't legal, but if you're caught with them, Portugal focuses on your health rather than jail time. The dissuasion commissions are operated solely out of the Ministry of Health. There's no criminal justice arm to them. And if you're a person who uses drugs and appears in front of the dissuasion commission, you are given access to treatment on demand. If you don't want to or can't stop using drugs, harm reduction services are available to anyone who needs them. Portugal began looking at the problem through the lens of health and safety in 1998. Under decriminalization, the framework to deal with problematic drug use was moved from the Ministry of Justice to the Ministry of Health, an agency far better qualified to deal with the complex needs of people who use drugs. We are replacing courts, but the way we work is completely different from the court system because we work under the Ministry of Health, so you do not need a judge to decide upon those cases. It can be, for example, sociologists like I am, like myself. My focus when I see a drug user in front of me is health issues. By putting healthcare first, Portugal adapted their system to address the needs of their population, including people who use drugs. Overdoses declined, new HIV infections declined, as did rates of infection for viral hepatitis. Violent crime decreased, as did teenage and problematic drug use. And people's access to drug treatment increased by 60%. The results weren't perfect, but they were pretty good. We cannot end drug use. It's part of our societies, it's part of our lives. Many times people say uh, we cannot regulate drugs or we cannot legalize drugs because they are dangerous. Cars are dangerous. Technologies are, are dangerous. Facebook is dangerous. Is prohibition the solution? I don't think so. What the US could take away is that understanding that we actually need to deal with people, not with drugs. And that in reality, what we claim to be a war on drugs is in fact a war on people. And because of that, they're actually getting more of what they want, which is better people living better, healthier lives, and less drugs. It's hard to imagine a world where people who use drugs aren't met with punishment. The US has spent enormous resources escalating the war on drugs. But in Portugal, the model doesn't just exist. It's actually proof of the possibilities. Portugal is just one example of drug decriminalization throughout Europe and Latin America that shows us it's possible. What we need is for you all to believe we can make it happen together right here in this country. It's time to end the over-reliance of the criminal justice system to deal with a public health issue. It's time to decriminalize drugs 
right here in America, right now. I'm Greg Gardner, Senior Staff Attorney for the Drug Policy Alliance. DPA is the nation's leading drug policy organization fighting to end the drug, uh, drug war and advance policies grounded in compassion, science, public health, and human rights. We at DPA are hosting this series in collaboration with Bloomberg American Health Initiative at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Fair and Just Prosecution, and the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution at John Jay College. We want to especially thank the Bloomberg American Health Initiative at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health for contributing funding to make this series possible. And also thank you to Geronimo and Tiffany at On Point Productions for producing today's panel. If you missed the first uh, panel in our series titled The Evidence, Why Some Prosecutors Are Declining to Prosecute Drug Offenses and What the Evidence Shows, you can tune into the link shared in the chat box uh, uh, here. We hope you had time to watch the video at the beginning of today's session, which briefly explains the approach taken by Portugal over 20 years ago to shift toward a public health response to drugs and the positive outcomes achieved as a result. If you missed it or want to share the video, we'll include a link to the chat uh, in the chat as well. Increasingly, more policymakers in the United States have started to also recognize the ineffectiveness and harms caused by more than a half, uh, half a century of prohibitionist drug war policies and started to rethink the approach of addressing drug use through the criminal legal system. In 2020, Oregon voters approved a ballot measure by a large margin to decriminalize personal possession of all drugs and greatly expand access to health services. After just one year of implementation in Oregon, 9,000 fewer people have been harmed and burdened by possession arrests and over 300 million in funding has been made available for harm reduction services and treatment. But well before Oregon became the first state to eliminate the threat of criminal punishment for simple possession, a number of individual prosecutors throughout the country were taking steps to divert more cases out of the criminal legal system. While many prosecutors have historically promoted policies that relied heavily on criminalization and incarceration, many have started to rethink that approach in some places creating more post-booking diversion programs, and in others fundamentally questioning whether such cases should be charged at all in the criminal legal system. Our panelists today represent prosecution offices that have been among the leaders in using their discretion to advance drug policies grounded in principles of harm reduction, public health, and racial justice, and implementing some of the first policies to decline to prosecute all low-level possession cases. In today's panel, we wanted to dig into the details of those policy decisions and explore how the policies came about, the opportunities that led to some of those decisions, and some of the challenges they faced and lessons learned from those efforts. We're honored to be joined by Sherry Boston, the District Attorney for the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit in DeKalb County, Georgia, who will get us started by explaining how prosecutors can use prosecutorial discretion to advance public health, and introduce a newly released prosecutor's guide as uh, published by our partners at the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution mm -hmm. for which DA Boston uh, also advised. We'll be sharing the link to that in the chat as well. Um, we'll also be joined by policy directors from Baltimore, Philadelphia and Brooklyn who have been instrumental in implementing non-prosecution policies for drug and other offenses in their jurisdictions. We're lucky to have with us today, Michael Collins, who's the Strategic Policy and Planning Director with the Office of the State's Attorney for Baltimore City, Jill Harris, who's the Chief of Policy and Strategy for the Kings County District Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, and Mike Lee, the Chief of Staff for the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Thank you all again for making the time to be with us today and sharing some insights with your colleagues and advocates around the country who may be interested in implementing similar reforms in their jurisdictions. If you have questions for our panelists, please submit them in the chat or the Q&A feature. We'll try to address as many of those as possible. And bios for the panelists are also available uh, through the webinar links that were provided. To get us started, we'd like to turn to DA Cherry Boston, who was elected in 2017 to serve as the district attorney in DeKalb County in Georgia. Uh, DA Boston's office handles the prosecution of felony offenses and has instituted several innovative programs focused on prevention and intervention uh, and reducing criminalization. 
uh, DA Boston has become also a vocal leader throughout the nation on criminal justice reform. Uh, DA Boston uh, served as a member, as I mentioned before, of the public health working group created by the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution that advised in the development of the guide she'll tell us more about today entitled, A New mm -hmm. Approach, A Prosecutor's Guide to Advancing a Public Health Response to Drug Use. Thanks again for being with us today, DA Boston. At this point, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Gray. Um, it really is an honor to be here, um, especially with uh, my colleagues um, that are doing great and amazing work uh, in New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore. So thank you so much for having me. Um, so I think if we go ahead and put up the slideshow, um, I, it is my honor today to uh, step in and, and talk a little bit about the work that our working group did. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, information. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'll start off with telling you a little bit about me and my office. Um, I assumed office in January of 2017 as district attorney. Um, and as Grace started, stated, we oversee felony prosecutions um, in DeKalb County in um, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, one of the things that I think is important that sets my office apart from many offices across the country is that we are a felony only office. So um, there is a separate office that handles misdemeanor cases. Um, and so I used to run that office. Um, that is the Solicitor General's office and they handle misdemeanor offenses. Um, and so prior to becoming DA, I served as Solicitor General I served as a magistrate and a municipal court judge. Um, and so I had the opportunity to see the criminal justice system from, from many aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to give you an idea of our office, um, we have uh, about a staff of 230 uh, folks in our office, soon to be about 200 and. 70 based on um, some new positions that we have allocated to deal with the backlogs of COVID. But in our office, we have um, uh, various amounts of units. We have anti-corruption, appellate, crimes against elders, crime strategies and community partnerships, digital forensics, um, diversion and community alternatives programs, domestic violence, sexual assault, firearms, violence prevention unit, homicide and gangs, juvenile, pre-charging, um, I could go on and on, but uh, I think the basic way is to say that we do a lot of different work and we have a lot of specialized units to address the crime uh, in our community. Um, next slide. So for us in the DeKalb DA's office, I really wanna talk about what our mission and vision are. And I, I, I try to start every presentation I give um, whether that's nationally or locally, or even when we do orientation for new onboarded members of our office, um, the mission and vision of who we are um, is the backbone of what we do um, and how we envision um, and are reimagining prosecution is, is intimately linked to that. And so I like to share that all the time. So the mission of the office of the district attorney is to safeguard our community through the vigorous and fair prosecution of felony offenses occurring within the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit. We seek to accomplish this goal by preserving the dignity and best interests of our victims while using smart prosecution strategies that balance offender accountability with prevention, intervention, and restorative justice. We believe in the power of engagement and in building relationships with community partners for the betterment of DeKalb County. And our vision is that we endeavor to restore faith in the criminal justice system and disrupt cycles of violence, trauma, and recidivism in our pursuit of public safety and justice. Um, and so everything that we do in our office, every policy uh, that we implement um, is based in the, the vision uh, of that premise. Um, that we're working within a system to disrupt cycles of violence uh, and to restore faith in our community. So next slide, moving into 
um, the work that our public uh, working group got to do. Um, we created a guide, and as you can see on the screen, it's called A New Approach, A Prosecutor's Guide to Advancing a Public Health Response to Drug Use. Um, and so uh, this was created um, with a number of conversations. I say conversations because they were um, lively debates. Um, but ultimately, we wanted to examine this issue um, with a group of folks working in and around this space, a group of people affected by the space, um, to really see if we could come up with some recommendations. So um, as we know, for decades, the United States has relied on the criminal justice system to respond to substance use disorder with minimal success. Um, we know that because we're still talking about it um, decades later. And with that in mind, the IIP published this uh, new approach, the Prosecutor's Guide to Advancing a Public Health Response to Drug Use, and several corresponding videos um, that we'll give you the links for at the end that provide prosecutors with strategies for advancing drug policy, um, and grounded in principles of harm reduction, public health, and racial justice. Next slide. We had a wonderful, uh, really wonderful group of people that worked on, on this. Um, and I won't call out all their names, but I want you to note that we had a diversity of folks. Um, we had prosecutors, uh, we had policy directors, um, we had um, folks that uh, have been impacted with the system. Um, we had uh, defenders uh, and defense lawyers. Um, and we really did want to make sure, and we had academics. We wanted to make sure that we touched on every aspect of the community to really talk about um, the recommendations we wanted to make. Um, and we had people from all over the country with various backgrounds and involvement in the system that allowed us to really share the dynamics that we're seeing um, from South to West to East to North um, and, see, and really examine this issue from various lenses. Next slide. So as a result, um, we were able to come up with some recommendations and I want to um, share those recommendations with you now um, and so first and foremost, all right, um, staff education and training. Um, we determined, and, and let me just say, when we talk about our working group recommendations, um, not everybody agreed on every aspect. We didn't have unanimity on everything that we talked about, but we were able to come to some critical understanding of certain pieces that we all agreed um, should be best practices or should be recommendations that we want prosecution offices to consider. So one of the things we did was staff education and training. Um, absolutely in agreement that prosecutors are not medical professionals. Um, and so that we should invite those medical professionals, those subject matter experts, into our spaces um, to train, be a part of our training and education. Um, and ultimately that also includes directly impacted people, um, persons that can continue to understand the history of US drug laws, the physical effects of, of substance, substance use disorder, um, and really uh, train our folks to understand why people use drugs and not just use drugs, but sell drugs, the nature of the recurring use, medical treatment and other options. So staff training and education and understanding is critical part of the recommendations. Next is um, changing the narrative, both inside and outside of our offices. Um, prosecutors have the ability, the exposure and the platforms to be able to use their status to change the narrative around drugs by emphasizing the importance of things like pre-arrest programs and harm reduction resources. Um, and prosecutors should support these programs, should support these efforts, should be vocal about these efforts and 
start to really use the correct language, um, both inside and outside the office. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that, that we did in this working group is trying to find ways to spread this information. Use of discretion. There's nothing more important to a prosecutor than discretion. It is probably the biggest tool in a prosecutor's toolbox, the discretion to charge, discretion not to charge, and everything else in between. So we also noted that prosecutors should use their discretion to decline to prosecute certain cases, limit, limit reliance on cash bail, and use mandatory sentence structures sparingly. Uh, if possible. We recognize that every jurisdiction is different and have different laws and different requirements. But so therefore, we just say that we encourage prosecutors in their individual jurisdictions to use the tools that they can that will work for their jurisdiction. Evaluate your drug courts. I, I don't know that there are many jurisdictions in 2022 that don't now have drug courts in their jurisdiction. Um, and so you should evaluate those drug courts and make sure that the role that your prosecutors are playing in their sports are within best practices um, and are focusing on particularly public health over punishment. And sometimes that means um, holding our judges accountable uh, in those courts because a lot of them are judicially based or judicially run. They're perhaps not prosecution run based um, drug courts. And so it's important as the role of the prosecutor in these drug courts to perhaps remind the judiciary that this is um, a process that is aimed on public health and not punishment. And then of course, office practices. Should, uh, we should obviously in an all sentencing avoid coercive plea tactics, encourage um, our trial line prosecutors to look um, at the persons charged in a holistic manner, look at the whole person, um, look at personal circumstances and consider as always alternatives to incarceration um, where appropriate. And, and I think where we landed is in that in many drug cases, alternative, there is an alternative to incarceration. And so we encourage prosecutors to do that. So those are just some of the recommendations. Obviously, uh, we're going to encourage you to read the entire report um, and see all the areas that we talked about. Next slide. Um, we also incorporated some, we did some videos, um, and you will find that we did a public health initiative video series. And if you go on the link, um, and I think we're going to post the link in the chat. Um, that allows you to have direct access to some of the videos that were created by the working group members to talk about specific issues. These are just great video resources with a snippet of information on a topic that you can easily share um, inside your prosecution offices. And also these are great video series to share on social media outlets, um, from your offices to educate the community and the public on the issues around the declination of, uh, of, um, of drug cases, as well as allowing the public to understand the importance of looking at this as a public health crisis and not a criminal justice system problem. Um, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to discuss the work. Um, that our group did, and I will turn it back over to Gray um, to start our question and answer panel. Thank you so much, DA Boston, um, for providing us that intro and what it looks like to reimagine prosecution and, and look at drugs through a public health lens. Um, at this point, we do want to shift into more of a discussion with all of our panelists you know, our goal had been today to really get into more of the, the nuts and bolts of creating these policies um, and talk with some of the, the real architects of some of the policies that have been put in place in the early days of the pandemic and subsequently to reduce the number of people jailed for and even uh, booked for low level misdemeanors um, and some of the subsequent policies 
that have been put in place uh, after the after the pandemic um, to some extent subsided. Um, to start us off, it'd be helpful if each of you could tell us just a little bit more about the policies you've put in place to reduce drug possession prosecutions in your jurisdictions and how those policies sort of came about, um, sort of what went into those decisions. Um, Jill, can you maybe lead us off with that one? Uh, what, what does it mean for a prosecutor to take a harm reduction approach to drug use and, and what have you implemented so far? So, so first of all, thanks DPA, thanks Fair and Just, thanks all of the sponsors for this great program. And thank you, Sherry, for that uh, introductory presentation and for all the great work you're doing. Um, so what it means, I think, I think Sherry hit on it. And I think um, it's important in general for prosecution to look at the whole person and to think about the person as opposed to the drug or as opposed to the crime. And it's something in the Brooklyn DA's office that we try to do with all of our cases um, to think about what is who is the person, not just what they did and what do they need? Because we're about public safety. We want people to not engage in criminal behavior. They're doing it for reasons. What, can, what do they need to stop doing that? And so in the drug context, um, it means seeing them as a whole person and, and seeing what they need and not punishing them for their drug use. If we're talking about a health issue and we're talking about um, something that is, is, shouldn't be criminalized, then we don't criminalize it. So if someone is arrested for drug use, uh, for drug possession, simple drug possession in Brooklyn, um, they're met at the precinct by a peer. We have a program um, with a provider. They dispatch a peer who's someone who has their own experience with criminal justice involvement or with drug use, they go to the precinct, they meet the person, they tell them, um, we have access to these services. If you want them, you don't have to go to court, your case can get dismissed if you want to do this. Um, and they refer them to various services. And, and one of the things that we want to get away from that, that in the past drug courts have done is make them make services sort of contingent and make them mandatory and make them punitive if somebody doesn't go ahead and avail themselves of them. So in Brooklyn, they're met at the precinct, they are offered services. The services are things that they might need, you know, like naloxone training or an HIV test or a social security card or something that actually is useful to them um, that they determine once they're kind of assessed, they determine in, in, in connection with the person who's assessing them. And then if they complete it, if they do take, they just have to meaningfully participate, which means do kind of one thing, then the case gets dismissed and they don't have to go to court. This is all pre-arraignment. If they don't do that and they end up going to court on a desk appearance ticket, so it wouldn't be a live arrest where they're taken to court, they would just have a day to go to court. Basically, when they get there, those same options are offered. Um, we don't sort of punish somebody for not taking the first chance to do something. Um, they still have those same options. And if they do them, the case is dismissed. And sort of ultimately, whether someone does takes advantage of a service or they don't, there's they still don't end up with a criminal conviction. They're still not prosecuted because we're not prosecuting people for their drug use. And that's kind of what it means to to see drug use as a as a harm reduction health issue. And there are other issues when people's drug use leads them to you know, can do theft or engage in other crimes. We can talk about that later, but that's just it basically. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, Michael, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you've done in Baltimore. DA Mosby has really been a vocal leader on, on uh, declining prosecutions as a whole. Um, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how your policies have evolved and how your policies are actually implemented and whether or not people even do come to court um, as a result of, of a, an arrest or an interaction with police. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, I, I had worked at Drug Policy Alliance for six years, I should note that conflict of interest, um, which really kind of influenced um, you know, a lot of my thinking on drug policy. And I met um, Marilyn Mosby um, at a congressional hearing on uh, marijuana legalization and then ended up coming to work with her and you know she had spoken about 
the failure of the war on drugs. She had visited Portugal as part of a delegation of, of um, prosecutors. Um, she had already stopped prosecuting marijuana. She was one of the first um, prosecutors to do so. And so she was already really interested in decriminalization. Um, and so, you know, my job when I joined the office in October of 2020 was to try and figure out how we were going to do that as an office. And, you know, I spent some time in other jurisdictions like Seattle and Philadelphia, speaking with other prosecutors about how they went about doing this. And we were really kind of moving forward in a kind of softly, softly approach. And then, um, you know, March 2020, uh, COVID-19 hits. And, you know, we had seen, you know, from media outlets like the Marshall Project and the appeal that COVID-19 was going to be a major problem for people in, in prison, people in jail. And so that kind of sped up what we were planning on doing anyway. And um, she issued a memo that, um, you know, announced that we were going to stop prosecuting a number of low level offences, one of which was um, drug possession or CDS possession, as we call it. Um, you know, it was, it was a straight up, you know, we're not prosecuting it at all. Um, and I can get into why we ended up making those decisions. But, you know, one of the big reasons was we didn't want people to be coming down to, you know, central booking, getting booked, getting arrested at all during COVID. Um, you know, after a year, um, you know, around about March 2021, um, we made the decision to make the policies permanent. And we really had three reasons for that. One was um, that, you know, there was no positive public safety impact of prosecuting these offences in the year that we saw uh, these policies implemented. We didn't see people go on to commit more serious offences. We actually worked with researchers at Johns Hopkins University to to dig into the data on that. Um, at the time, our courts were reopening and we had a big case backlog and we wanted to focus our resources on more serious crime, but of particular importance to um, to my boss was, you know, the impact of uh, drug possession laws on racial disparities in the city. A lot had been written about, um, you know, the impact on, on, on black people of arrests and prosecution, the racial disparities, um, you know, we, especially in the sort of uh, post George Floyd setting, recognize as an office that, you know, often when black people have these you know, negative and, and deadly interactions with law enforcement, it can start off as something very trivial, like a loose cigarette or a counterfeit twenty dollar no, note. And, and drug possession for us was part of, you know, um, stopping prosecuting drug possession was very much part of a strategy um, you know, of, of police reform and larger criminal justice reform against the backdrop of, 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 of you know, what we were discussing as a country in terms of, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and George Floyd and, and all that other sort of stuff. And uh, when I turn to you next, Mike, um, are, are you all in Philadelphia declining to prosecute generally or is it, um, is it a case-by-case -case basis uh, in application of discretion? Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, Greg, and thank you for having me. And thank you to Drug Policy Alliance and Fair and Just Prosecution for doing not just one, but two panels on such an important issue. Uh, and right now in Philadelphia, the only substance that we decline outright to prosecute is uh, possession of cannabis. Uh, due to just the overall um, competing pandemics of uh, homicide by firearm, uh, overdose deaths, and COVID-19, uh, we're not in a position to safely uh, decline to prosecute all controlled substances. So much like you've heard the other uh, panelists talk about, we're meeting the system where it is the same way we're trying to meet people with substance use issues where they are. And right now as a, a system, a holistic government, we don't have an alternative uh, intervention model like how Portugal replaced their public health, uh, public safety with the public health department or like DA Boston is talking about, um, which I would surmise as the goal of public health is to keep someone alive 
and the goal of public safety, i.e. prosecutors, judges, cops, is to keep people off drugs. And I think it's not realistic to try to keep people off drugs. And what we're trying to do at the Philly DA is better align ourselves with the public health goal of keeping someone alive and transitioning them as fast as possible back into the public health system and hope that we can start to address some of the stigma and narratives that keep having this issue push back into uh, police and prosecutors and judges making legal uh, medical decisions. Let me follow up on that, um, both with you and, and perhaps with Sherry, uh, DA Boston as well. In terms of discretion, how are you doing that? How are you making those connections with public health system and trying to refocus uh, more of the, more toward a service-based uh, uh, policy instead of a criminal justice, criminal legal system approach? Sure. Um, as I think it's been mentioned before, it's collaboration and bringing, uh, I think the first recommendation from the report is having experts come in to teach you. Uh, and a really good example of that is uh, I am a member of the policy team, but I was not the policy director. Instead, I supervised adult diversion programs of which drug court fell under as well as a few other um, diversion programs that were created to try to fill the gaps drug court wasn't. Um, so there was a lot of discussion internally in my unit of people using as an aggregating factor, uh, someone being pregnant while using a substance, saying that is so immoral or the stigma to that is so strong that uh, I think this person should go to trial or have some other type of intervention. Um, there were some people who said, the exact opposite that creates a vulnerability or a protection that we need um, more health intervention and less uh, law enforcement intervention. So uh, fortunately, a friend of mine is a doctor who happens to specialize in uh, prenatal care and substance use, and they had to come in twice to have conversations with us about what is the medical decision-making process, but then more importantly, what role does the medical decision-making process in that course of treatment have any bearing on what we do as prosecutors? And if we're using it for something other than a reason to withdraw, to remove a burden from someone, uh, then it is like a misappropriate use of treatment information or an understanding of the cycle of substance use and making sure we're following through on the values we say we hold as progressive prosecutors. Hey, Boston, can I ask you as well, um, when, when you, you talked in your presentation about trying to encourage prosecutors to utilize their discretion um, more in, in, uh, through a lens of public health, um, how, how does that happen in practice? Like, what are you doing uh, within your office to try and encourage that discretion to be utilized in the proper way? And do you have guidelines that you've put in place of what should be dealt with in the criminal justice system and, and what uh, diversion opportunities should be put in place otherwise for, for others? Yes, yeah, so um, let me just say that I think uh, teaching and implementing discretion by your line prosecutors, I think probably all these policy directors would agree is the hardest task in the office. It's easy to write a policy. It's even easier, hands up, to be a DA and just say, so it be done, right? The hard part is getting all the folks that are doing the work day in and day out on the line and in courtrooms to, um, to understand that they have the discretion, one. And honestly, I mean, we have a lot of young lawyers working for us, teaching them what that discretion looks like. Um, because uh, whether it is pressure from the judge that they're assigned to or a fear that they're going to do the wrong thing and ultimately make a mistake that they think is going to get them fired, um, it, is, it, it is immensely difficult to teach, teach like discretion. But our approach has been this. We start off with the proposition of saying to everyone, you have discretion to make choices. Now, 
are there some choices that when you make them are going to require you to get sign off from a supervisor? Absolutely, right? Because that allows supervisors to make sure across the board that people are utilizing their discretion in a good way and that we are implementing the same types of structures and standards across the entire office and that we don't have um, justice dictated by the judge or prosecution team that your case happens to get assigned to when it comes into the office. So how do we do that? And let me just back up and say, you know, what our policy is and, and what we implemented. And, and similar to Baltimore, um, a lot of our policies around declination, around drug offenses came out of COVID. Um, this was an issue that I was watching a lot of my um, DA colleagues across the country implement before. And I was, I was waiting to figure out what's the best way for me to, do, to, to address the issue of drugs. Um, and again, as I stated in our in the opening, um, my office is a felony only office. So we didn't have we don't have misdemeanor cases unless they're attached to felonies. Um, and so I think where you saw most people starting in this idea of declining to prosecute was with um, possession, single use, personal use amount of marijuana. That's where a lot of these policies started. Well, that couldn't be our starting point because we don't get those cases. Our starting point were felony possession. Now, in the state of Georgia, marijuana personal use is the only offense um, that is a misdemeanor. The rest, uh, any other type of drug is considered a felony. So that's, that's where we started. So when COVID hit, it presented an opportunity for us to put into action, I think, what every prosecutor's office on this webinar was already doing, which is prioritizing the violent offenses happening in your communities. Um, every one of these offices, including mine, were in urban areas where domestic violence, sexual assault, murders, and gang cases were at the forefront of our minds. And so, uh, what COVID allowed us to do or for the public and community leaders to understand was, hey, what we were saying before about focusing on violent crime, like COVID now has forced us like you to understand that that's what has to happen. We can't spin our wheels on on these other types of offenses that are not having the violent impact in our communities that these other crimes are. So I was able to implement a policy around declining to prosecute personal use of all drugs, um, really with no pushback or feedback, because I was able to say, listen, we just don't, we no longer have the resources for this issue. So whether you are willing to accept the proposition that I don't think the criminal justice system is the right way to deal with the public health crises, or whether you can hang your hat on the fact that I really have to shift all of my resources into prosecuting the most violent crimes in my community, yeah. this is what we're doing. Um, and so as a result, um, we were able to implement a policy where um, we did that. And when we get to the idea of discretion, how do you teach your young folks how to do that? We, we literally gave people a chart of what personal use amounts are for each drug. I said, we have to define that for people. People need to understand what that means and there has to be a definition. Further, we went on to say, um, how do we deal with sale cases? Because um, if someone had more than what we had defined as a personal use amount, they were likely charged with possession with intent to distribute or perhaps even trafficking, depending on the weight they were carrying. Um, and so one other thing that we did was in our alternatives to incarceration, we said some cases we can decline to prosecute, but there's a whole category of cases that perhaps don't have to be prosecuted in the traditional way. And so we expanded our diversion program um, that previously did not allow for these types of offenses to go in to be admitted. So sale cases could go into what's called our stride program, 
which stands for Stopping Trends of Repeat Incarceration with Diversion in Education. So we started putting those cases into our STRIDE program in an effort to help those that are charged with sale cases, you know, to give them the training, the education, um, the job availabilities, the counseling services, everything that we needed to um, move them from the criminal justice system into being fully active participants in the community. Um, so those are just two things that we've done along the way. Um, and it's allowed us to remind people and remind our attorneys that uh, drugs don't necessarily and should never necessarily mean conviction, incarceration, and prison. That if we can talk about dismissal and diversion and accountability beyond just drug courts, then we're offering many opportunities to pull uh, drug, drugs and substance abuse disorder away from the criminal justice system and into the public health format. You, you raised a bunch of issues that I think are really important to this discussion. I hope we have time to get to them. Um, but one of the first things you focused on was the resource issue. And um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more from all of our panel about how much you've thought about and uh, evaluated, analyzed the, the resources that do go into prosecutions. You know, there are a ton of touch points in every prosecution. Once you, you know, develop the charging document, um, even pre-screening, other administrative work by the courts, for sometimes forensic work, sometimes, you know, just a, a, a lot of steps along the way for, um, an individual to be charged and then processed through the courts, um, many court hearings. Um, and I, I, I want to just, I'm wondering if any of you have been able to sort of quantify, I know Mike, your office has such a robust data and evaluation unit uh, that you all have built, uh, or any of you, have, have you had a chance to sort of quantify the costs that, that can be shifted into other types of, of work that your offices have to do? Uh, just by reducing these types of uh, drug possession, low level prosecutions? We're actually in the process of working with researchers at, at Johns Hopkins to do just that. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to do because of all the different steps and all the different variables. I was actually on a call with them yesterday, kind of talking it through. And, you know, some people don't necessarily want to give the answers that you know, in terms of like the cost and, you know, for, for, for you know, obvious reasons, um, you know, they, so, so we're working on that just now. I mean, we have, you know, done a, a, a sort of similar partnership with, well, it's not quite a partnership. Johns Hopkins did all the work and we handed over the data, but, um, you know, we, we did allow them to kind of look at what the impact of our policies was in terms of actual, you know, raw numbers um, and, you know, what, one of the main things we were interested in is when we introduced our policy, um, we actually applied, we applied it retroactively um, as much as possible. In other words, we had a number of pending cases that were pre-March 2020, and we had to make a decision about, you know, that what we were going to do about those um, cases, and we decided to dismiss all of them. And then we ended up also eliminating, um, you know, a number of warrants. And we handed over a lot of that data anonymized to Johns Hopkins and said, tell us what happened to these people in the criminal justice system. You know, one of the narratives you get about not prosecuting low level offenses is, well, we got to start with the low level offenses because, you know, then you prevent the more serious crime. Um, the Johns Hopkins report, um, one of the things that it, that it found was that, you know, after 14 months, the recidivism rate was 0.8%. So a very low rate of people reoffending on more serious crimes. In other words, the person who was being picked up and arrested on drug possession was not going on to, to, to pick up a gun or commit a, a more serious offence. Um, the, the, the police largely followed our policy and so we managed to um, you know, avert arrests, and those were arrests that, 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 that the Johns Hopkins researchers projected would have fallen 
almost exclusively, about 80% on black people. And I think all that data was really important for us because, you know, at the end of the day, and people have touched on this, we're not a public health agency. We're not the experts on this issue of, of drug use that is fundamentally a public health issue. We are interested in public safety. And when a report comes back from, from Johns Hopkins that says, you know, what we had been doing for years, for decades, was having no positive impact whatsoever on public safety. And, you know, as many people know, entering the, the criminal justice system can be incredibly detrimental for um, people who use drugs. Then, you know, I think that supports our decision to go in another direction. I mean, we had, for example, there's been a lot of drug courts uh, discussion on, on, on this call. And people will say, well, you know, can you not connect these people to treatment and so on? We actually had a situation where for a drug court program, people were saying, you know what, just give me the jail time. I would rather do the jail time than do the drug court because the drug court program is two years, it's probation. It felt quite onerous versus just sort of taking the, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 15 days, whatever it would be jail time and being out from under that. Right. So it wasn't really succeeding in terms of its aim. We've managed to revamp our drug court program to focus on, you know, those crimes that would be like adjacent to drug use, robberies, thefts, things that we are still prosecuting, but are, um, you know, fundamentally linked to drug use to make the drug court program um, more successful. So, you know, going back to the question, you know, we are looking into, um, you know, cost savings. We've certainly seen a resource saving in, in, in terms of alleviating the caseload. I mentioned the coming out of, you know, the initial sort of lockdown or, or, or of the court system, we had a huge case backlog. We had cases prior to COVID, we had cases during COVID, and then we had cases, well, we're not quite post-COVID just now, but we uh, we had cases that were sort of, um, you know, as, as, as the courts were reopening. And it, it just felt to us kind of like unconscionable to say, okay, let's go back to prosecuting drug possession when, you know, you have victims of crime who have been waiting for their day in court for you know years and we're going to focus on the heroin possession case or we're going to focus on you know the cocaine possession case as no public safety benefit that just didn't make sense to us and that was one of the reasons that we continued the policy and made it permanent and i'll, I'll just build on that uh, wonderful answer from my colleague in baltimore and i would say that uh, we're also working with some external experts on e e economics to try to figure out the overall cost, but the back of the napkin math is pretty clear in that, uh, to Michael's point in replacing who is in the diversion programs uh, with the people more likely to have a longer term of incarceration uh, than someone who's less likely to have it. So the cost of the very, very resource intensive drug treatment court program is less than uh, future crimes on individuals or future years of incarceration if someone's substance use continues to uh, lead to criminal activity like burglaries or robberies. We also know that diversion is cheaper than going to trial because we don't have to get the uh, forensics back for the controlled substance. We don't have to subpoena police officers um, and we don't have uh, nearly as many court listings. Uh, Diversion programming itself is probably more expensive, but the cost is shared more equally among other stakeholders. So we're adding people from behavioral health into the courtroom, adding people from uh, outside service providers into the courtroom. Uh, and that leads to the question of, well, why do we have to do this in a courtroom? And that's what we started experimenting and expanding on uh, during the pandemic with saying, well, since courtrooms are closed, can we replicate a lot of this without as many of the same expenses or participants? And now we're starting to find, uh, like Michael said, is like, you know what? People can connect themselves to assessment and treatments when they want it. People can find community service opportunities when they want it. And when someone is represented by, um, uh, competent defense counsel, they can work with that individual to accomplish all those things as well. So we uh, talk about the potential to create savings, but it's incumbent upon other government actors to actually take this money that we're saving um, by 
not taking something to trial or by having fewer cases in our uh, traditional diversion programs and putting them more in community programs and say, take this cost savings potential and reinvest it into other things that will continue to lower the overwhelming burden on the criminal legal system and all the different stakeholders. How, how compelling are those arguments, you know, when you're dealing with policymakers and with public as well, um, the resource allocation issues are, I guess I'd ask any of you, um, Jill or, or DA Boston, but um, is, is that a fairly compelling issue when it comes to trying to reshape opinions around using the criminal legal system for dealing with drug issues? I, I would say, I would say prior to the pandemic, it probably was an argument that seemed to fall more on deaf ears. But since we've been through this two year COVID pandemic and we have seen an uptick in violent crime everywhere, um, in, in urban areas and rural areas in every jurisdiction, um, and people understand that the world in many industries stopped and that the court system really was affected, I think the resource issue now is, is heard very clearly. And I have not seen anybody question the resource issue. In fact, what I have seen is stakeholders that previously um, would have, you know, crucified someone for saying resources are an issue are now very clearly stating we need to place an emphasis on the most harmful crimes in our communities. Um, and so I think right now where we are, the resource argument um, is being heard in a way that I don't think it was heard at all prior to um, the COVID epidemic. Yes, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and um, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is that it's not just resources that are um, our resources in our office, but it also, when we do something, it impacts the police and then they do different things. So when our office started, started declining to prosecute marijuana cases, the number of marijuana arrests just plummeted because the police department was just, if you're not gonna prosecute them, why are we arresting them? And similarly with the non-prosecution of the low level uh, drug possession, the arrests have gone down. So I'm, I pulled some, some statistics just to make this point. Um, in 2015 uh, and 2016, arrest for 22003, which is marijuana personal use, or excuse me, which is personal use possession of a powder, heroin, cocaine. Um, they were five, over 5,000 in 2015, 4,700 in 2016, around 4,700 in 2017. DA Gonzalez was elected at the end of 2017, took office in January, 2018. Uh, the arrest for 22003 fell between 2017 and 2018 from 4,700 to 3,300. Um, and then between 2018 and 2019, they fell even more to um, 1,948. So under 2,000, so went from over 5,000 in 2015 to under 2,000 in 2019. And that was before COVID. And then in 2020 with COVID, it went down to like 1,300. And in 2021, it was 1,100. So when we take action as prosecutors, the police department responds, um, whether they sort of make a decision to do that or not at some high level, that's what ends up happening and those arrests decline. And so it's not just prosecutor resources, but it's also police resources that are being saved, that are being moved, that are being used to deal with more serious crimes. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, thanks for providing the numbers. I, Can I, I have one more back. point? Oh, yeah, of course, Mike. Uh, I, I would say that the one audience where the resources argument hasn't been quite as successful are communities where there's a high level of um, drug sales, uh, violence related to it, and open drug use. Uh, those individuals um, are much more concerned with the quality of their life, uh, of the neighborhood, and so forth, and making sure that they're being heard as. Um, 
equally as members of the community of people who use drugs. So we often um, reach out to uh, neighborhoods that are impacted by uh, some of the issues around substance use uh, to make sure that we are able to explain what we're doing, uh, get feedback on how what we're doing has changed, but also just hear back from them on what they would like to see uh, occur and make sure that we're all in lockstep with what's going on uh, because the people who live in areas most impacted are not just people who use drugs, but people who just live there by whatever reason. So I, I think it's equally important to make sure we keep them uh, in the conversation as well. Yeah, I do think that's a great point on communication of the policies in the community. And I do wanna go back and talk a little bit more. We promised a nuts and bolts type of conversation about this issue. And I, I, I guess I would ask in terms of putting together the policies, you know, what, what kind of outreach did you do with stakeholders and um, others in the community and particularly, you know, people who are most impacted by uh, drug policies? Um, what, what is some of the, the process that you, you've gone through in sort of developing uh, the frameworks that, that you've put in place so far? Um, does anyone want to start with that? Yeah, I, I, can, I can jump in there. Um, I mean, our process was a little different because it was sped up due to COVID-19 and the stuff I mentioned earlier. I mean, I think we had done a lot of outreach already, though, to different groups in the city and different stakeholders. Um, you know, I think, to be honest, you know, one of the things that we learned was, you know, I think it was very important for us to get some sort of buy-in from law enforcement and, and, the, and the mayor, and in particular the leadership there. I mean, there's often with progressive prosecutors quite an adversarial relationship between, you know, the police, the mayor and the, and the, and the, the, the prosecutor's office. But we've actually been pretty fortunate in terms of having like a, a good relationship there. Um, I think there's the buy-in before and then the, sort of the, 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 the kind of education that has to go on after. And one of the things we suffered particularly because of the nature of COVID and things being shut down. Um, it was sometimes difficult to do education, but we did a lot of kind of um, town halls online um, with members of the public. Most of the sort of complaints I would say that we get about the policies are misunderstandings. Um, or I, you know, I was told that you're not prosecuting people who sell drugs or, you know, you don't prosecute crime at all anymore, or these small crimes lead to bigger crimes. That was, why you know having this Johns Hopkins report was so important to us because it was like it's not just a Scottish guy who's saying the policies are successful it's a very esteemed group of researchers that are doing it and it really bolstered what we are trying to do but um you know I think having that data and having that research is really important you know we went round and visited all the, the you know we had a good buy-in from the police commissioner but we also went round and to be quite frank, took our lumps from rank and file police officers. We went to different roll calls and I stood up there and said, here's what we're doing. Do you have any questions? I'm not going to pretend that they were like patting me in the back and giving me high fives. You know, they were all, it was quite contentious, but you know, I wanted them to understand what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, you know, the other thing that, I, that I'll mention is that's especially important for, um, you know, for the public is, you know, Look, we are not, as I've mentioned, a public health agency. We're a public safety agency. But just because we're not prosecuting the offence doesn't mean we don't care about those people. And, you know, we have tried to and, and we continue to build partnerships with different public health organisations in, in, in context of drug use. We have good partnerships with harm reduction organisations, drug treatment facilities, um, people that we trust. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of stigma attached to drug users and I think that's one of the problems that people sort of talk about drug users as if they're not part of our society and not part of our community and talk about them and so we're trying to kind of like break down those barriers and tell people well you know these people are not just you know drug users they're part of our community they live in our streets and they, they, they have jobs and you know all that sort of stuff and we've tried to kind of humanize these individuals as well but yeah I mean I think one of the challenges that we've had is 
as you know, the police and, and prosecutors pull back from, you know, these sort of low-level crimes are fundamentally not about public safety. You know, it is still for a lot of people a quote-unquote nuisance crime, right? And even if it isn't a public safety, like they don't like seeing somebody using drugs and they don't like seeing somebody selling sex on the streets. And, you know, you can understand that. And so what we've tried to do, and I think what is, we're still working on, is do a lot in terms of street outreach, you know, have partnerships with organizations and not just any old organization, an organization that specifically will go out onto the street in a non-coercive way, you know, whether it's crisis response, mental health, um, drug treatment, sex work, and try and connect these people. The challenge is, is that, you know, you're, we're nowhere near the footprint that police have, right? And, and, and for a lot of people, the night 911 when they see a problem on the street that's their first port of call and the police show up and they take that person away and you never have to think about it again and we're trying this new approach because we know that fundamentally doesn't work for our society but um you know it requires patience and and, and, and requires you know fresh thinking and, and sometimes you know patience is, is is in short supply is there anything you you wish you had known or thought of before uh you implemented the policy that you you would have done uh, differently, Michael or uh, or others. Um, I guess the, I mean I'll, I'll, I'm, I don't want to dominate the time. The one thing I wait, I think I wasted a lot of time thinking about, you know, things like triggers and thresholds and what is buying and what is selling, and I never really gave much thought at all to the retroactive portion. Or um, yeah, I mean like we we I remember like sort of week two of doing the policies and we're getting the numbers in from central booking and I'm seeing people are still being picked up on drug possession and I'm saying like I thought we stopped prosecuting drug possession they're like oh yeah that is people getting brought in on a warrant and I'm like okay so what do we do about warrants and we had to go through this whole warrant process of like quashing warrants and then you know I mentioned we had people with pending cases we had to make decisions people on probation um, drug courts, you know, there are a whole variety of things, you know, you really have to kind of, I wish I had thought a lot more about that. I mean, I think we made the right des decisions. We applied the policy as retroactively as we could. Um, I think that's a good thing. But again, I think I got hung up a lot when I was visiting Seattle and my friend Mike Lee in Philadelphia. I was really like thinking about buying versus selling and thresholds and quantities and this gram versus that gram and in the end that stuff didn't really mostly say it didn't matter it just wasn't front and center the, the more important thing for us was um you know the, the, that retroactive piece that's something that i wish i had thought of before what do you do about previous cases and the impact on other sort of diversion programs of, of doing this new approach i still hope if we have time to talk a little bit more about the thresholds and and the uh, buying and selling issues. Jill, was there anything that you had thought of before that you wish you had thought of before you, you started this and that you wish you knew? Um, um, I can't think anything of anything to add. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Um, let me go to the threshold question because it is such a tricky issue for so many um, policies. Uh, so, so much of this. Um, when it comes to developing these, um, there's so many opinions about what constitutes low level possession and what should really be in the system, what's not in the system. Um, do you have any suggestions um, in retrospect for other for people in other jurisdictions about you know how to establish these policies, whether to, to utilize uh, firm limits, firm weight limits? Um, should different substances be treated differently? Um, how much discretion should line prosecutors have? You know, those types of issues, are, I think, are just so critical and tricky for a lot of uh, folks working on these issues on the policy front. Um, well, they have any more in New York, they, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. In New York, the, the thresholds are kind of set by statute. So less than an eighth of an ounce is a 220.03, a misdemeanor more than eighth of an ounce or eighth of an ounce or more is felony possession with intent to sell. So for the misdemeanors, it's easy where it's sort of personal use quantities by definition where it gets more challenging or in the possession with intent to sell the felonies. And um, 
I think for the most part, it's it's sort of what people have been, what Sherry was talking about at the beginning with training, because someone can get more than an eighth of an ounce, it can still be a personal use quantity. Um, and I think in general, the office has de-emphasized um, possession at all, unless we're talking about massive amounts, to the point where if a, if, if a felony came in that was over an eighth of an ounce, that was you know felony weight, it would probably still be reduced to a misdemeanor and handled in the same way, unless there was, unless it was, unless it came from a warrant that was executed, you know, that where they found it in someone's house along with other things. But in general, if someone's arrested on the street for, you know, a little bit more than what is considered misdemeanor weight, it, the case would probably still be dealt with the same way. Yeah, and I think we actually took an approach of more focusing on what is our definition of selling. Um, our sort of lowest selling count, if you like, is possession with intent to distribute. And so rather than trying to nail down, well, what is meant by possession, we really honed in on a definition. And we actually have, there's like a sort of uh, court of appeals decision that was very helpful in defining what possession with intent to distribute. You know, you have to have certain indicia of selling, you know, baggies and money and all sorts of stuff you, you know they, they laid out for us what that what it means in, in, in the state of maryland to um you know be charged with that 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 lowest level selling offense and then everything below that for us was going to be possession i think we didn't want to get in a situation where by saying all oh, possession is anything under a gram you know different people use drugs at different rates right you know what might be possession for somebody um, you know, a certain amount that might be different for somebody else, right? Um, you know, we also didn't want people, you know, police to just kind of like be like, okay, anybody over a gram now, we can grab them for selling. Um, and we also didn't want to send a message out to people selling drugs like, well, you know, as long as you keep under a gram, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do, you're not going to get charged with selling. You know, that was, so So we kind of worked through all of that stuff. And what we ended up doing, as I said, was really rather than focusing on amounts and, and, and a definition for possession, we really focused on what the definition of selling is and what it means to sell drugs in, in, in our state and, and, and then kind of went from there. It sounded like, oh, sorry, DA Boston, I was going to go to you next, actually. Okay. Um, it sounded like was... you were talking about some of those issues before and, and actually reaching some of the higher quantities and, and individuals may, maybe uh, making eligible some of those populations who do engage in selling allegedly. Yeah, so I mean, I think the most important thing to take away from just this question you asked and all the answers you've gotten thus far, and I know Mike's going to come up after me, is that, you know, there are different approaches by each office, despite the fact that we all are, are, are going after the same goal, how we define these terms um, is really predicated on the communities we serve and the laws that exist in our states. And I think that's really important for prosecuting officers, offices that are watching this webinar is to understand that there's no cookie cutter approach. You have to do what you think is the best. And, and for us, it really was, we decided to be driven by the amounts because we felt that um, giving our, talking about personal use in the office I, I, we felt like our lawyers needed guidance on what personal use is. So our policy is very specific. And we laid out about, really, we chose the 10 or dozen most commonly charged um, drugs that we that came across our desks. And I told my staff members that worked on this policy, I said, I want you to get in a room and decide what you think is personal use. Now, to what... Michael is talking about, which is, you know, is that the personal use for everyone? Absolutely not. And so one of the things that our policy said was, um, you know, it leaves open, and this is where discretion comes in, is that when we talk about sale cases, we gave people kind of guidelines as to well, what are the types of things that would be um, evidence of sale, you know, and our policy talks about whether that scales, whether it's how the drugs might be packaged. So the idea is, for example, our policy says two grams or less of cocaine can be dismissed as personal use. But if someone had three grams and 
no, um, there's no evidence of sale in that case, then it would be appropriate for that attorney to go to their supervisor and say, hey, uh, it's not, this is one of those cases where I, you know, I can use my discretion. I have to get approval because it's outside of what has been delineated as personal use, but there's absolutely zero evidence of sale. And the other thing we encouraged our staff to look at was the history, the criminal history. If you have someone whose criminal history indicates that they are substance abuse disorder, meaning you're going to see prior possession offenses, maybe you're going to see some theft charges because you know, we know that people that suffer from substance abuse disorder will uh, perhaps are committing theft crimes in order to get money to buy drugs. If you are seeing a history that's consistent with someone that is uh, using drugs and has substance abuse disorder, we want you to take that information into account um, versus perhaps a criminal history where someone has, um, you know, 15 trafficking charges, right? High levels of, of drugs. So it's about teaching the factors that fall outside of those guidelines. And we never want our lawyers to say, oh, it's, you know, 2.1 grams of cocaine. I can't think about any al alternative. What we ask them to do is once you get outside of sort of the guidelines that we have set for what is personal use, we want you to use your best judgment and examine the rest of the evidence in the case to see if it's still a case that's ripe for dismissal, or perhaps it's on the borderline and you say, I don't want to dismiss this, but I want to send it to Stride, our diversion program, because I think that this particular person could benefit from the, from the um, advantages that are offered in a diversion program. And I still want to avoid traditional prosecution. And incarceration. And, and uh, just to follow up on that, uh, one issue that we've tried to deal with a lot at DPA and try to encourage others to think about is uh, letting go of that that clear distinction between uh, those who possess and, and sellers, and rethink this concept of the drug seller. Given particularly the nature of a lot of drug selling and, and the fact that a lot of people who engage in, in selling drugs or themselves users or simply engaged in subsistence selling uh, just to survive. Um, is that something that you're sort of encouraging or, or working into your policies? Um, is that something that you think uh, really needs to be lifted up and, 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 uh, and uh, providing additional eligibility for some of the, the diversion programs in particular uh, that, that you all have been designing? Does anyone have thoughts on that? We, we do have a thought. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, everyone has thoughts on these great questions, Greg. Uh, and I will say, just going back half a step to the um, thresholds and personal use, um, I was actually in, initially in favor of it and saying we should treat substances different and weights different, um, sort of how uh, Portugal does, where the intervener walks around with a scale to try to make these determinations, but uh, I just can't get past the feeling that if it's set up that way, it'll disproportionately negatively impact people of color because there's way more stigma around uh, the perceived drug of choice for people of color or how they use the drug than it is for other people. And we don't have to look further than how the overdose death crisis was reported on when it was majority white people. And now that it is slowly becoming majority people of color dying from overdose with fentanyl introduced into non-opioids, uh, the, the softness of the response is starting to change and some of the humanity is starting to be replaced with more of this punitive, uh, enough is enough, I'm done with this pandemic, like the people walk around saying, COVID what, I took my shot. Uh, so I do think it's important that researchers help us um, decision makers on better understanding the racial and socioeconomic impact of not just the distinction of personal use uh, for charging or what track someone goes on, but also for this distinction around 
who is or is not selling for what reason. And if you're selling because it's your main way to be a quote unquote responsible parent, um, that's a little better than if you sell in it just to get a nice car, right? But now it's just a bunch of moral judgments and not rooted in decisions around our safety or decisions around the personal health for the other individual. And without additional information, I think from, um, don't hate me for saying this, non-lawyers and other experts uh, that come to the table to give us better guidance on uh, long-term social determinants of health and what we can do to help people stabilize those. Um, and all of our policies should ultimately be working towards uh, those metrics of success as opposed to whether or not we're accurately distinguishing between someone selling to use and someone selling to pay rent or selling to impress a group of people. There's, there's so much here that I wanna keep asking you all, but I only have time for a couple more questions. Um, so I'm gonna to jump to something that I think Mike uh, mentioned earlier is some of these opposition narratives, some of these false narratives that really have been raised about some of the efforts that, that you all have been doing. Um, there, there are people that criticize these types of, uh, this type of work saying that, you know, without the threat of punishment, most people won't engage in treatment or uh, they try and link, you know, the, the numbers and fatal overdoses um, to the policies to reduce uh, prosecutions. And, um, and even, you know, the, the connection between violence and, um, and drug markets. Uh, so what, what would you all say is being misunderstood um, with those types of narratives and, and how do you counter them to help explain that these public health policies are not to blame for some of those issues? Uh, I, I can go first and allow my co-panels to think a little bit longer. Uh, and I'll tell a, a very short story. Uh, for about four years now, every time I've gone to talk about what our approach is to substance use, I get asked a question that's similar to this. Well, how many times will you not prosecute or divert somebody before you will say it doesn't work and they need to be incarcerated? And I pause and think really hard. And I say, if I had to put a number to it, it's probably one more time than you would arrest, convict and incarcerate someone before you acknowledge that it doesn't work. Uh, and really moving the conversation past what Michael was talking about, where the one of the most constant forms of government response is 911. You dial the number, government is in front of your door, theoretically helping you with the situation. There aren't enough alternative phone numbers for you to call to get immediate response for uh, whatever situation is. So as a result, the narrative around the best way to solve your problem is law enforcement is really, really entrenched into all of our decision-making, um, whether in a professional or personal capacity. And what I try to do is combat that with um, using the current state of this isn't great and we've arrested ourselves into this situation. So maybe we should do something different to get ourselves out of it and supplementing that with uh, data to try to dispel what is or isn't happening in a particular area. But all of this is with limited success. And I hope that through panels like this and conversations across jurisdictions, there can start to be a more common narrative around destigmatizing people who use drugs and um, lifting up the idea that the health department is the best way to address this current crisis. Yeah, I, um, I think a lot of them, as I've said before, a lot of the sort of myths or the pushback we've had publicly have just been like misunderstandings about our policies. And some of that has been, you know, there's been like a deliberate campaign of misinformation from folks on the right wing, you know, Fox News and the FOP and our, our governor, um, you know, spreading a lot of misinformation about our approach to these policies. I mean, it is a very tough time to do criminal justice reform right now, whether it's drug policy reform or progressive prosecution. It's a very challenging moment because of the, the, the sort of 
national trends, but also the media narrative around crime. Um, and so, you know, you're trying to get the public to understand that what you're doing does not have a negative impact on public safety, the thing that, that, that a lot of people are most concerned about right now. And certainly from our point of view, the Johns Hopkins report, having like a report like that was super helpful. There was a similar report out of um, Boston, Suffolk County, where they had stopped prosecuting misdemeanors and it actually led to reductions in, in crime. Um, I think, you know, to, 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 to Mike's point, you know, a lot of people, and I, again, like, I would sort of call them like yard sign liberals. They'll put signs in their yard saying, you know, no more drug war or Black Lives Matter or hate has no home here. And then when you do the policies that they are sort of espousing with their slogans, they will say like, well, not like that. Or like, well, it's, I, I didn't want you to do it that way. And that's just very challenging because as I said, you know, they, they're so used to calling this magic number and somebody popping up and, and disappearing the person that they have deemed to be a nuisance in, in this case um you know a drug user and that that aspect of somebody being a nuisance and the reliance on law enforcement to solve every problem is not something we're going to change that overnight right and 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 you know people feel the way they feel um and i think as mike said you know what we're trying to do is pivot away from that law enforcement solution towards, you know, services. Um, one thing that we've done quite well in these kind of town hall meetings is actually just walk people through what does it mean to be somebody caught possessing drugs and arrested by the police and then go through the criminal justice system. And people are sort of quite interested to hear, well, the, the extent to which it doesn't work in terms of stopping that person. So I think they have in the as well just arrest them and that will stop them from using drugs. And you say, okay, you somebody gets picked up for a small amount of drugs, they get taken down to, to, to central booking, absent another serious offence, they're going to be out pending trial, right? They're, they're not going to be held without bail. Yeah. Um, so they're going to be back on the streets, right? They're not going to stop using uh, drugs, right? And so for you that sees that person as a nuisance, even if I disagree with that, you're not getting rid of the problem by the the police sort of showing up and, and, and arresting the person and so let's start focusing on these services even you know though that they're, they're sort of non-coercive right which is a good thing let's focus on the harm reduction services let's focus on the street outreach let's shift those resources in that direction so that we can truly have a, a, an approach that is effective yeah thanks michael um, we're down to about 30 seconds well maybe about two minutes left um Final comments, uh, DA Boston or Jill? Um, I will defer to the, DA, to the DA. Well, I mean, I think the takeaway from this really wonderful, robust conversation is something that I said all along, which is, you know, when we, you know, the title of this webinar is declining to prosecute a discussion with policy directors on how to get started. Um, I really think what you've seen here is an approach from four different jurisdictions and four different cities um, that all approached uh, with the same idea in mind um, with a, a different way of doing it. And, and I think we've all talked about lessons learned. And I know that my policy is still evolving. Um, and we are actually about to expand our policy um, based on some of the uh, feedback we've gotten from our staff and and we are actually waiting to to see what the data looks like after the policy has been in effect for a year because I think all of us on this webinar are data driven offices that want to make sure that when we go out into the community and talk about the policies we've implemented that ultimately we're going to have data to support why it is a successful and necessary policy so if you are on this webinar and you're trying to figure out where to get started, I think the first thing I would say is, you know, coming here is a great first step. Hearing the information is wonderful. And sitting down internally with uh, your staff to figure out what the needs of your community are um, and how you might best address them with a policy that has a lens towards public health. Uh, and uh, avoiding continued and unnecessary incarceration and mass incarceration around the use 
of, of drugs. That's a perfect place to stop. Thanks so much for that, DA Boston. And thank you all for spending this time with us today to discuss the issues. I feel like there's so much more that we could cover if we had the time. Um, and thanks also for everything that you're doing in your jurisdictions to, to implement these more compassionate, rational drug policies. Um, we hope the conversation inspires and helps others around the country advance their own public health approaches to drugs, especially uh, those grounded in decriminalization and shifting resources toward harm reduction services, safe supply, and treatment on demand. Um, for more resources on decrim decriminalization and reform efforts around the country, please check out DPA's decriminalization exchange site, uh, which we'll share in the chat. And if you're interested in the IIP prosecution guide discussed earlier, you can download it at the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution site at prosecution.org slash public health. And if you missed last week's panel featuring DA uh, Marilyn Mosby, Miriam Krinsky, and researcher Susan Sherman and Anna Harvey, we'll uh, share that again in the chat as well. Uh, thanks to my colleagues, Sheila Vicaria, Tesha Naidu, uh, Eliza Cohen, Jules Netherland, and the rest of our team for helping to put together the panel. And uh, thanks again to all the panelists and all of you for joining us today. Hope you all have a great evening. Thanks.